I'm going to talk about Feed the Cats, which I think is a, a revolutionary approach that, uh, that really excites me. Uh, I'm 63 years old, 42 years in coaching, and I am younger now than I was 30 years ago as a coach because of this. Because my guys inspire me every damn day. And we're going to talk about how you can have that type of life as a coach. And I, I talk to other Feed the Cats coaches, and I, we talk a lot about we're changing the world one coach at a time, one kid at a time. And I think it's, it's it, I don't think I'm being hyperbolic when I say the revolution starts now. So uh, uh, I'd like to start with kind of a review of my 10 pillars. Kind of gets me excited, gets me focused. Mission statement. Mission statements are all BS, except for when they're good. <laughs> right, right? You know, uh, uh, like school mission statements. You know, preparing learners for the future. You know, like, come on. Uh, these are very precise. I got to convince you tonight that speed is the holy grail of track. It's a speed sport. That speed is trainable. Oh my God. People say, oh, speed is just genetic. Well, so strength. Do we lift? Yes. Why don't we sprint? I don't know. Make track the best part of a kid's day. Argue with that. It wasn't for me, but it is for my kids now. Do less and achieve more. Counterintuitive. And the last thing is to feed the cats. Feed means nurture. Cats are athletes. Nurture athletes. And don't say, oh, I don't want to have any cats. Well, yeah, because you treat them like dogs. Stop it. Cats. So the first thing we have to do is break tradition. And this is hard. It's hard to break tradition. B.J. Stevens from Purdue got, good God, 934 retweets, 3,812 likes in 24 hours. People say, well, he's trying to be, no, he's not trying to be funny. He's trying to be truthful. And athletes from all over the nation said, yeah, that's my experience too. I hate track on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. Oh, I love track on, for track meets. And then I'm sore on Sunday. Well, he would be a lot, lot, lot better for me than he would be for those stupid coaches at Purdue. Because we're not good at what we hate. And if we're training dreadful, miserable crap in practice, we will never be as good as we should be. This was actually a former Olympian and college track coach who chimed in on this, and you can say, oh, I think he's trying to be funny. I don't think so. I love coaching track and delivering pain. I'd fire him. I saw a tweet with this. This is Norman Dale from Hoosiers. It got like 10 million likes by every coach in America. My practices aren't designed for your enjoyment. That's badass. That's tradition, but it ain't right. Any fool can get another fool tired. This guy posted this. I thought he should be like accused of abuse. But instead, 80% of the replies were like, you're turning a boy into a man, tough love, you're the father this boy never had. Are you kidding me? This was the first track practice in the summer. This is why I get fired up. This is not right. And this isn't either. Jinx, ranked number nine in the country. Why did they get so good? It's because of this. Are you kidding me? They're posting this. And they're not getting fired for posting it. And then somebody brings in like a, a 
Navy SEAL or something to help with football practice one day. And I, I quote, I quoted the or quote tree and I said, this is not feeding the cats. And he retweeted me like that was a good thing. And you think, oh, this is just random stuff. No, this is stuff that schools are proud of. Proud of. A school in Texas this year, somebody justified this by, hey, they only lose one or two games every year. Maybe they shouldn't lose any. What is wrong with people? What is wrong with sports in America? I just think it's dumb as hell. And, and coaches are afraid to point it out to each other. It's just stupid. But see, tradition is like a tribe. And we evolved as a human species, and we found security and comfort in tribes, in groups. And we were able to live long enough to have kids. Whereas if we were off on our own, we probably got ate by a saber-toothed tiger or something. We didn't live. So that's why we today join stupid political parties. And, and, and we all belong to the church that we were born in. Nothing wrong with that, I'm just saying. And we follow tradition. We're very tribal because it's in our DNA and we can't help ourselves. So much so that we're willing to go along with the group no matter what. This test has been done thousands of times. 42% of the guys do just what this guy does. 42%. like every football coach in America right there, assistant football coach, they go along with the group thing. Otherwise, you're not going to be on the staff anymore. So tradition is really powerful stuff. When you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. If you study history, majorities have been damn wrong consistently throughout the human experience. Group thing. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. That's what I've tried to feed the cats. It's a new model. Two reasons why coaches should feed the cats. A lot of people think that the feed the cats is like, we're just mamby-pamby, you know, a lot of love and hugs and stuff. No. We do it to win. If it didn't win, it wouldn't work. I would. If miserable practices were best to win, I would have miserable practices. Because we played a game and win. So it's the most important thing. When I went to feed the cats in 1999, we won the state championship in the 4x1 four, four of the next six years. Never been done, it never will be done again. I knew I was on to something. We won. Now people criticize me. They say, oh, it's a gimmick. Systems don't work. How many Olympians have holler coached? Or how many state football championships has Holler won? Because Feed the Cats football is a deal now. I mean, it's, we're, we're talking about tomorrow at 8, 8 in the morning, if I get up. <laughs> now, I did coach a fast guy. Marcel's more is fast. Because a lot of people thought that all of my stuff was just based on this one guy. That's a curse. It wasn't based on one guy. All my guys, guys get fast. All of them. Whoops. Now, these three guys were all coaching a feed the cats system. Plainfield Central, Hopkins, Minnesota, 
Rice Lake, Wisconsin. Three of the best athletes ever. So even though maybe I haven't coached an Olympian yet, I've been directly coached a couple of them. Hundreds of football teams. Most of them in Texas, of all places. Now feed the cats. We'll talk about what that means tomorrow morning. It's revolutionary, and it works. Enterprise High School, Alabama, basketball state champs last year. They feed the cats basketball school. Princeton, uh, I'm heavily involved in the lacrosse world now. I've never held a stick, never watched a game. But I'm going to talk to John, Johns Hopkins University for two hours, Monday, Central Michigan, Tuesday. Uh, Princeton now feeds the Tigers. When they started, they had three guys running 20 miles an hour. Now they have 17. Oh, and, and their top four players, amazing. If you go up by one mile an hour, you're a new, new guy. Oh, and by the way, first time in 18 years, they made the final four. Feed the Tigers. I, I hear they say feed the Tigers at least a dozen times during every game. Feed the Tigers. This is what one mile an hour looks like. Actually, 1.37 miles per hour faster. Buda Baker, state champion, state of Washington, 10.70 in the 100. But DK Metcalf runs him down because he is 1.37 miles an hour faster. So if we can get one mile an hour faster, we have totally changed the trajectory of our athletic career. The Yankees fed the Cats this year in spring training. At the start, they only had three guys running 22 miles an hour. That's fast. They had 12 at 22 miles an hour by the end of spring training. The New York Yankees. The other reason why we feed the cats is another three-letter word, joy. I could argue that joy creates winning, and winning creates joy, so it's kind of like reciprocal. Now, when I coach, I, and my dad was a coach for 47 years, basketball, high school, and college, great coach. And so I kind of knew what I was doing, so that's why I coached. I coached just like my dad. I copied <coughs> successful programs. I visited Bobby Knight. I visited Coach K. I read books about Gene Cady. I copied these guys, and I didn't realize that legendary coaches have legendary advantages. But I copied them. That's what we do, right? We copy success. I was intolerant of losing. I was a horrible loser. And I thought that was a good thing. Isn't that weird? I thought it was a good thing. By God, I'm not a... No. I believe that you need to outwork the competition. I told my team that all the time. I also believe that somehow I was helping turn boys into men. That's the thing a lot of coaches say all the time. I've never heard anybody talk about turning girls into women. Coach Banta, do you talk about turning girls into women? That's kind of weird, right? Yeah. It's, it's like... It's even weirder now that I have my own... <laughs> I, I, I don't think you want to turn your girls' athletes into women. No, it's a deep thought. Oh. <laughs> and I believe that it's okay for practice to suck. Because that's what it takes to have glory. We've got to go through hell to get to heaven. That's what I believed until I was the age 40. And then my dad, <laughs> then my son told me, even though he could like dunk a basketball in the eighth grade, Say he wasn't going to run track. He's sitting right there. Uh, and he said, Dad, I, track sucks. And I was like, yeah, but it did. And it was like a bell went off in my head. I was like, I got to make it better. I got to make it better. Focus on the things you love doing. Otherwise, you'll never be good at them. David Sinclair, uh, expert on aging. It's so true. You're not going to stick with something that you hate. The endless feedback loop. When coaches start trying to make practice the best part of a kid's day, kids get enthusiastic. Athletes love your sport. And guess what? It makes you a better coach. You go home and you're not an asshole anymore. <laughs> You know, like the normal coaching experience is to push kids into effort when they're miserable. 
And it's hard to turn that off. It's hard to. I know. I'm reading this book right now. It's absolutely fantastic. It's a deep quote. Uh, what is important doesn't necessarily get our attention, but what, what gets our attention becomes important. You cannot tell a kid that this is important. Pay attention. You gotta find a way to make it important. I think Ryan Banta is a pro at this. I think John O'Malley's a pro. I think every good coach is a pro at this. If you're working on something that you really care about, you don't have to be pushed. The vision pulls you. I, I hope you have stuff that pulls you in your life. That you don't have to push yourself. You don't have to rise and grind. I hope so. The gauntlet, I think, is a cool clip. I created this. Uh, this is just happy. This, this is kind of like the backbone of Feed the Cats. Now, we don't do this because kids love it. We do it because they run faster. Every time we do it twice a year, 62% on the average since I started in 2012. 62% of my guys doing this run fast, the fastest they've ever run in their life. Ryan called it juice. There's some juice there. Good juice. So in review, the team with the best athletes usually wins. Do you agree? Should. No matter how good of a coach you are, you'd like to have a couple first round draft picks. You want to attract athletes, track more than any other sport. If, if we didn't work at it, guys, our team would look weird. It would be nothing but like distance runners and nerds. <laughs> kind of the same thing though, right? But we also want to create athletes. Attract them, create them. So I'll review why we feed the cats. Number one, win. Number two, join. That's why we do it.